Selection is quite literally the most important process in the entire Zettelkasten. Yet a lot of Zettelkasten practitioners either don't know of its existence or are not doing the process correctly. So in this video, I'm going to be teaching you all four levels of selection so that you are aware of it and you know how to do it properly. Before I do that though, I should probably introduce myself. I'm Nico, and this is my two and a half year old Zettelkasten Clover. I've been working as Scott's protege for the past eight months and have read this book front to back more times than Scott himself. Up until now, I've been operating in the background, but a few days ago, Scott asked me to create a video on selection. And so instead of doing a first person shooter style video, like the ones that I do on my own channel and the ones that Scott did before on this channel, I decided to rank, crank up the production quality just a little bit and include a tripod in this production. So now with the introduction out of the way, let's move on to step one of the selection process. I have a little bit of a cold, so my voice sounds different, but phase one of the selection process is to choose which source to actually dedicate your time to. There are so many sources that you can actually spend time with. For example, literally on my own desk, I have Scott's book, I have these books, I also have these books, all of these. On top of this, next to me is my laptop, which has access to YouTube, so many more research papers, podcasts. Basically, you are surrounded by sources and things that you could dedicate time to. For this reason, that is that there are so many different things that you could spend time on, it's very important to actually be selective about what you actually do spend time on. Scott's book gives a few recommendations or guidelines about how to become more selective about the sources you choose. His mostly apply to books, but there are a lot, as I said, sources come in many different ways. I'll quickly go over them though. The three guidelines that Scott gives are to one, not trust bestseller lists because a lot of them are synthetically fabricated. Two, it's to not trust popular channels where books are normally advertised on because those are, there's no indication of whether it's actually a good source. It's just an indication of how much money the author had to pay someone to do a segment on their book. And the third guideline is to spend time with original sources. And so you want to go back to the person who originally wrote about an idea instead of the secondary sources writing about the writing of someone who had the idea. You want to go back to the first account. The reality is, is that most sources aren't actually worth spending a lot of time on. There's quite a few books that I've been able to go through in literally a day, an hour sometimes, even 30 minutes, because after reading the first chapter, I've gotten the point and the, the rest of the, those pages are just repeating the same thing from a different, yeah, it's just repeating the same thing. And so it's not actually useful to spend time with that. Another guideline which I follow is to generally try to stick with older sources that have repeatedly come back and are still being useful today. So just on my desk, these are Meditations by Marcus Aurelius is a book that I've read multiple times because it's it's just so great. There are so many good ideas in this and I've used it to write my own code of conduct. And this has helped me more than any other self-help book. And classifying this as a self-help book is actually not correct, but this has helped me more than any self-help book that I've read. Another guideline would be to read things outside of your reading skill. So for example, one, another one that I'm currently working through is The Republic by Plato. To be fully honest, I barely understand a lot of what's being said here, but I'm taking the time to actually go through and decipher what's being said, trying to increase my actual comprehension. Another guideline would be to read from people that are offering an unconventional perspective. The conventional wisdom is probably already ingrained in you, and so you should be reading and exploring unconventional views and ideas so that you're able to actually build and contrast your ideas with others instead of just continuously gaining the, the same ideas from just different sources. How Emotions Are Made by Lisa Feldman Barrett basically flipped everything that I thought I knew about the brain on its head and taught me a lot of other things. Though this is a newer book, I believe it's from 2023 or 2022. Nope, I lied, it was from 2017. 
even though this is a newer book, it's publishing, it talks about newer neuroscience that has not yet made its way into the public mythos of neuroscience. And so this is, once again, an incredibly valuable source because it talks about things that are unconventional and that haven't made its way into popular wisdom. And finally, as was mentioned, uh, another way to think about the original source is to go to the first-hand account. These two books here, Spagyrix and the Antonin Settelkasten, <clears throat> this is about alchemy and the alchemy of plants and making medicaments with them. And this is a first-hand account of experimentations. The Antonin Settelkasten goes into the theory of Settelkasten, but also the first-hand account of the Antinet from Scott Shepard. Another example for selecting sources is something that I do on a daily basis. I read and develop in artificial, artificial intelligence, and on a daily basis, I, I wrote a program that basically pulls research papers from a website called Archive. And so it provides me with a list of just 25 research papers that were published today. On Archive, there's, on a daily basis, it's like between 80 and 100 and something papers in artificial intelligence. So this is a small subset. But then, I basically have this paper, I go through each title, and if I find a title that is applicable to my project, or that I want to read, then I'll highlight it in yellow. Now what I'm looking for in these titles are specific keywords. And so for example, agents is a very big keyword for me. I'm working on digital assistance. Another word for that would be an autonomous agent, or a generative agent, or a language-based agent. There are a lot of different keywords that can go into it. So as I'm reading through these titles, I'm looking for specific keywords that might hint that the paper is related to my specific project. Or, for example here, privacy issues in large language models, a survey. The reason I highlighted this one is that I plan to eventually write about privacy in large language models. And so this would be a good source to read. After finding the papers that I am interested in reading, then I load them up on Archive and read their abstracts. And so I get like a one paragraph summary of the paper. And usually just based on the title and reading through the abstract for keywords and what the paper is about and the results that they find, I can determine whether it would be a useful source for me. So this is an exercise I go through basically daily. But after reading through all three of the abstracts for these papers, there aren't any of the three that are actually interesting to me. And so instead of reading one of these papers, I just go into my, <laughs> my archive of references that I've highlighted from other papers that would be interesting for me to read. The next phase in the selection process is the priming phase. Now, if you are using an internet, then you know of the bibliography box. This is basically your reference. So when you, before jumping into any source, I always make a bibliography card for it. And the bibliography card is basically priming myself to get my mind into the right frame of reference for me to digest a source. What this looks like is, I'll show you the example from how emotions are made. Even though this is a book on emotions, on my bibliography card, basically the priming step is at the front of your bibliography card, you want to write the name of the book, name of the author, when it was published, why you're reading this source. So for me, it's a book, but if it was a research paper, I would write my goal in reading that research paper. If it's a video, I'd write my goal in watching that video. Then you write a quick summary overview. And so even though this is a book on emotions, my actual goal reading through it is to learn frameworks I can apply to artificial intelligence. Priming your mind before you actually dive into a source is going to make you ready to actually select good material and ideas from this source. And that's the next step, but we'll, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Basically priming allows you to have something to compare ideas to. With my goal of learning frameworks that I can apply to AI, whenever I come across a new idea, I know exactly what, what I'm looking for. If, it, if it's a framework I can apply to AI, then that's an idea I might want to write down at the back of this card as an observation note. If it's nothing related to that, then I can just skip it because that's not my goal in reading this book. The next phase is to actually select ideas from your source and determine which ones you should actually spend time either putting onto your bibliography card creating an external reference for it, or creating a full main card for it. Those are basically your four options. 
When you come across an idea, you can either ignore it, you can write it on your bibliography card, you can create an XREF for it, or you can create a main card. In his book, Scott presents the following matrix. This is the importance and urgency matrix. Basically, you want to look for irresistible ideas. These are ideas that are immediately useful to you in the sense that you don't have to wait before you can start using it in your own work and they are important. If you come across irresistible ideas, you will want to write them down on your bib card and write main notes for it. Scott says that you should only pay attention to irresistible ideas and basically ignore all the other ones, either whether they're ex excellent, good, or bad. I want to offer a second matrix that you can use that uses different variables than urgency and importance. Instead of only paying attention to irresistible ideas, here's the matrix that I would like to offer. Instead of using urgency and importance, you use applicability and novelty. If you find an idea in your source that is immediately applicable and is novel to you, and so it is useful for your work and you haven't seen it before, you will want to create a main card out of it. By the way, all of these start on the bibliography card. While you're reading, you only want a bibliography card next to you and you always make an observation note. But then afterwards, while you're processing your observation notes, if it's an idea that was applicable and novel, then you want to create a main card for it based on your observation note. If it was only applicable, but not actually novel, then you can still write it down on your observation note just to stamp it into your memory a little bit more, but you don't want to spend any more time creating a main card out of it. If it's novel to you, but it is not applicable, then what you want to do is create an external reference. Now these external references is something that I'm sure I'll cover in more depth in another video, but it's basically just a very quick reference somewhere in your antenna, either in your index or on a different card that's normally in red ink. It just says, if you want to learn more about this concept, go see this reference, and then it links to that reference. So then if I do come back and write about whatever I x ref'd, then I have a bunch of sources that are already laid out for me that I've or ideas from sources that I've already read related to that concept that are all laid out. And so I just have to go to those sources, process those ideas further since they now become applicable. And if you have, if you come across ideas that are not applicable or novel to you, just ignore them. It's not worth spending any time. And the last phase in selection is to select the secondary links on cards. And so this phase comes about while you're actually writing the cards. Let me show you some examples. In every card that you make, you have your primary link, which will be the card right before it or the card right, right after it. In these examples, I'm showing you the card before. And so I have a card here that both has the primary link. Every single card in your antenna has a primary link because it has to be filed in your antenna. And then you also have the option of creating secondary links. A lot of digital systems claim that these secondary links are the most powerful links. And so you create a lot of them so that it's connected everywhere across your antenna and you form a network. In analog, the most powerful link is actually the primary link, because when you find this card, you will inevitably find the card behind it. And it's the same way the, the other way. When you find this card, you will find the card before it. And so with the secondary links, you actually want to be very selective with them. You only want to put one, maybe two on a single card. And so here, the continuation is, a collective becomes a society once its members organize themselves. Within each item, there must be the rules of its organization. And then with the definition, with this definition of a society, every agent will need to include what it does and when it does it. And then I have a C link to a definition of an agent. An agent is a subsystem with a procedure and a condition for when that procedure is triggered. The primary link is the most important because this follows the train of thought. The secondary link basically points me to another location where a similar idea is being discussed so that I can continue this train of thought if I would like to. And the reason that this is part of selection is that, as I said, you need to be very selective with these. As soon as you have more than two, they basically lose all of their power because 
you're not actually going to explore every single one of these. You want to put one, maybe two, where it points you to somewhere else in your antenna. And now the final thing I want to talk about is how to actually improve your selection. The way you do go about doing that is through feedback, and it's through receiving feedback. The type of feedback you want is whether the notes you write end up being used in production. That means you need to get into a production mindset as soon as possible. As soon as you're reading something or watching a video or listening to a podcast, you want to have some kind of project in mind that you're working towards, whether that is a blog post, a small podcast of your own, or a video. Whatever you do, you want to have a project in mind. The reason for this is that when you get to that project and the actual production phase for that project, you can see how many of your notes are actually being useful to you. If the majority of your notes are useless with irrelevant information or aren't processed well, then your selection is off. You're not actually selecting ideas that are going to be useful for your project. Whereas when you get to production and things just flow because the, all your research is already there, you have ideas that are relevant, they're connected to other ideas that are relevant, and it just flows well, that means that your selection is on point. So that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, then I strongly recommend you get Scott's book. This is an absolute beast and it covers everything that I've talked about in this video and so much more in a lot more detail. If you want to review specifically what I talked about in this video and you have a copy of the book, then you should read pages 382 to 407. That is the chapter on selection.